Today, we step back in time to an era shrouded in black where etiquette was as rigid as the corsets worn by the ladies of the day. The Victorian era, known for its grandeur and strict social norms, had a particular set of rules governing how one should mourn the loss of a loved one. Join me as we unveil the secrets of a bygone era, exploring the weird customs and bizarre rituals where mourning was more than just a colour, it was a way of life. Welcome to the mourning etiquette of a Victorian widow. Hey guys, welcome to Historical Gossip. In this channel, we do what humans have done best since we've evolved to be a super aware being. Gossiping! The Victorian era, which lasted from the early 19th century to the early 20th century, was known for its strict and elaborate mourning customs following the death of a loved one. Queen Victoria herself set a profound example by mourning her husband, Prince Albert, for a staggering 40 years. She dressed in black daily and kept their home preserved exactly as it was on the day he passed. Because of the strict social norms shrouding over the death of a loved one, the Victorian Mourning Manual, often referred to as the Victorian Book of the Dead, was formed. It was a collective source of books, pamphlets and guides written to provide guidance and etiquette on mourning practices to widows and families during the Victorian era. The Book of the Dead had strict guidelines for appropriate mourning clothing. The most well-known attire was for widows who were expected to wear black clothing. A widow's attire typically included a black dress, black gloves, a black veil, and often a black bonnet or hat. The mourning period for widows could last for up to two years, with variations depending on the relationship to the deceased. Widows were expected to follow three distinct mourning stages. The first was deep mourning, where the widow would wear black for a year and one day. The second was called second mourning, which lasted for an additional nine to twelve months. And lastly, there was half mourning, which could last for six more months. This was a total period of 27 to 30 months. As the mourning period progressed, widows could gradually introduce lighter colours into their wardrobe. Following these rules was an expensive endeavour, and the extent to which they were followed often depended on one's financial means. For other family members and friends, the mourning attire was less strict and could include clothing in shades of dark grey, lavender or mauve. Children also had to wear mourning clothing and follow specific behaviours based on their age. Younger children wore regular clothing with black or grey armbands, while older children wore standard mourning clothing. Mourning jewellery was a significant aspect of Victorian mourning customs. These pieces of jewellery were designed to contain a memento of the deceased, such as a lock of the deceased's hair, a miniature portrait or a piece of cloth. Common types of mourning jewellery included lockets, rings, brooches, bracelets and even watch chains. The jewellery was often made from materials like jet, onyx, or black enamel, and all had a specific meaning. For instance, jet was believed to have protective and healing property, whilst onyx was believed to help the wearer cope with grief and provide the inner strength to move forward. Some pieces also featured symbols of mourning, such as weeping willows, urns, or crossed anchors. Many Victorian homes had dedicated memorial tables or cabinets where these items were displayed as a way to keep the memory of the departed alive. Proper etiquette during funerals was of utmost importance. Mourners were expected to arrive promptly, dress in accordance with their relationship to the deceased, and conduct themselves with solemnity and respect. During the funeral service, it was customary to avoid loud weeping or emotional outbursts. The bereaved were often provided with black-edged calling cards, which they would use to acknowledge condolences and express their appreciation. Small glass vials with rubber or cork stoppers known as lacrimotries were used to catch the tears of mourners during service. These vials were presented to the family of the departed as a sign of how much the person would be missed. 
Funerals were held in the homes of the person who had passed away with their body placed in a coffin in the parlour. Any shiny objects in the home, including mirrors, portraits and vases, were draped with black cloth. This was done to respect the lost loved one and to avoid the possibility of their spirit becoming trapped in mirrors. Family photographs were turned face down to protect family and friends from being possessed by a spirit of the dead. Clocks and watches would be stopped to mark the moment of death and symbolised the stopping of time for the deceased individual. It was also believed that keeping the clocks running during a funeral could bring bad luck or invite death to visit other family members. Neighbours and family members would visit to pay their respects. People would take photographs with the departed to commemorate them. These photographs often became the only pictures left of the deceased. It was also customary to have a constant vigil where someone would sit with the body for the entire time it was displayed in the home, providing comfort to grieving family members and to prevent rats from approaching the decomposing body. Since embalming was not as efficient as it is today, fresh flowers were also used to cover the bad smell of the decaying body during the wakes, especially in the summertime when there was no air conditioning. Doors and windows would be opened during the funeral, not just to expel the bad smell, but it was also believed to allow the spirit to leave the home freely. After a funeral, mourners were served formal meals, and those who couldn't attend received special funeral biscuits or cookies with sad poems, information about the loved one, Bible verses or prayers on them. As the procession to the final resting place began, the body would be carried out of the house feet first to prevent the ghost from being trapped inside the house. The funeral procession itself and the way mourners walked were also subject to superstition and tradition, and it was believed that walking in a specific manner could protect the procession against evil spirits. The burials typically took place in cemeteries, featuring elaborate and ornate gravestones and monuments. Depending on your wealth, families could opt for vaults or mausoleums for above-ground interment. These practices reflected the Victorian era's emphasis on remembering and honouring the deceased in a structured and ceremonious manner. The social behaviour for widows during mourning in the Victorian era was highly regulated, particularly for those in full mourning. These widows were subject to strict social isolation, only allowed to leave the house for church activity. If another close relative passed away during a widow's mourning period, the socially accepted grieving period of the new relative was added. As they transitioned into half-mourning, widows could gradually reintegrate into society, using black-edged cards and invitations to signal the change. Remarrying was a common means for widows to support themselves and their children, but they had to be cautious about timing to avoid scandal and ridicule. But, despite the challenges, veiled women in black were often considered attractive, giving widows options for remarriage, even as they hoped their new husbands wouldn't suffer a similar fate. The life of a Victorian widow was one entwined with death, elaborate mourning rituals and the strict expectations of society. While many of these practices might seem superstitious and outdated today, they were an integral part of the Victorian mourning culture and reflected the importance placed on expressing grief and honouring the deceased. Mm -hmm.